Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 108 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we're joined by Jessica Damiano, the Associated Press's gardening columnist, and we're talking to her all about frugal gardening tips. You'll definitely want to check out how she reuses lampshades in the garden. The plant profile is on chamomile, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events. This episode of Garden DC, we're joined by Jessica Damiano. She is an Associated Press gardening columnist and a garden consultant. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'm so happy to be here. Great to have you. And I can't wait to dive into our topic of frugal gardening because that is a topic near and dear to my penny pinching heart. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we'll be dropping lots of tips and, and experiences for frugal and cost saving and inexpensive gardening advice. But before we go into that, Jessica, we like to ask people here on the Garden DC podcast were you born with a green thumb and chlorophyll in your veins? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the child of immigrants. Parents are from Italy and my father always grew a garden, you know, growing up. So we had grapevines in the backyard and always tomatoes, peppers, herbs. And my dad grew roses and every week during rose season, once a week he would cut roses and bring them in for my mom and put them in a vase. It was very sweet. But did I, was I involved in the gardening? No, except for once when I was grounded and my punishment was having to weed, <laughs> which to be honest, I still consider a punishment. <laughs> Some people find it, you know, meditative. They love mm-hmm. weeding. And they say, yes, if there's one or two weeds, but if you're overrun, <laughs> somehow that sucks the fun out of it. But, you know, growing up, it was always, you know, Jessica, go outside and get some basil or go pick a couple of peppers for dinner or whatever. And that's just how I grew up. It was like a way of life. So, Um, I wasn't involved in it, but I was surrounded by it. And then um, it's a funny story. When I was in high school, they made, um, I guess I was a junior in high school, you know, getting ready to make some college decisions. And they made us all take an aptitude test that was supposed to, you know, it was like a personality test, just answer a bunch of unrelated questions. And it was supposed to tell you what you were best suited for career wise. And um, mine came out, you know, my friends got, you know, medicine or law or accounting. I got agriculture, which I was a city girl. I grew up in (laughs) Queens, New York. It was hilarious. I mean, I didn't take it seriously for a second. My friends called me Farmer Jess for about a week. It was a big (laughs) joke. It was a joke. Um, But, you know, sometimes what you're meant to be is what you're meant to be. Um, As an adult, you know, when I... um, when I got my first home, I always planted perennials and vegetables, tomatoes, always tomatoes. But I was just a backyard gardener. I loved it. I enjoyed it. But that was the extent of it. I worked in, um, I majored in communications in college, got a business minor, and I worked in broadcasting. That was my love. I wanted to be in radio. Um, I worked for NBC for a few years. And then there was like a mass layoff. I was looking for work in the back of a broadcasting magazine. And there was this brand new thing I never heard of called Prodigy. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Prodigy was AOL before AOL. Yeah, I was going to say, I might even have one of those CDs floating around somewhere. (laughs) So I didn't know what it was. And um, I, they needed a news editor. So I went and I interviewed and I got the job. Um, and I thought this online stuff, I don't know, it's not going to last, but <laughs> I'll, I'll get on this gravy train as long as it lasts. Like, who knew, you know? Um, and I ended up ending up in journalism. So, you know, fast forward a few years, I'm working for Newsday, my local paper in New York. And I was the uh, lifestyle and entertainment manager. And then I became the lifestyle and entertainment editor for digital, always digital. And the home and garden editor received a letter from a reader with a photo of a statue in, this back, in his backyard. He had just purchased his house. 
And he said, I think this is an antique. I think it's from ancient Rome. <laughs> so my editor said, you know, poke around a little bit, find out the history of his statue and, uh, and write something up. I said, sure. So I called a bunch of experts and it was nothing. It was, it was like, it was cast cement. It was made from a mold. It was nothing special, but I published his letter. And for some reason, like immediately I started getting emails and letters in the mail. I have this in my backyard. Do you know what it is? I've got this disease on my plant. I have this insect. And I said, oh my gosh, these people think I'm the garden detective. And that then became the name of my column. And I became the Dear Abby of gardening for Newsday, which I did for 15 years. But about, you know, a few months in after, you know, consulting with experts all the time to answer these readers' questions, I said, you know what? I better become the expert. This isn't, you know, the way I want it to go. So I wanted to be more knowledgeable myself. So I enrolled in Cornell University's uh, Master Gardener program, went through that. And then, you know, years of writing and researching, and I, now I'm the expert. So, so kids, pay attention to those aptitude tests. <laughs> <laughs> they know more. They know you better than you know yourself, apparently. Yeah, I'm, I'm so surprised because usually they just tell you general things like, you know, you're best suited to work by yourself, like writing or being a librarian or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Agriculture. <laughs> they, they had you nailed. That's fabulous. Nailed. That was funny. So growing up, you grew up with growing tomatoes and now you grow your own tomatoes and you're known for tomato specialty and expertise, correct? Yes. Um, while I was at Newsday, I tried to find a way to engage readers. You know, I always loved, in, you know, planning parties and things. And so, of course, I always wanted to engage my readers. I had poetry contests. I had, you know, garden poetry contests. I was always thinking of something um, to involve the community. And I came up with the Great Long Island Tomato Challenge which I um, hosted for 13 years at Newsday. And it was so much fun. It was like the search for the biggest tomato on Long Island, you know, and, and the readers, they would come 100, 150 of them with their tomatoes and they would, they would keep them in a basket covered with a, a dishcloth, you know, because they wanted to psych each other out. They didn't want everyone to see their entry until it was time for me to weigh theirs. And I would crown a new tomato king or queen, you know, and they all shared stories and they shared seeds with, with each other, which was very nice. Um, and that was a great experience. But yeah, I do have a very soft spot for tomatoes. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we host for Washington Gardener Magazine down here in the D.C. area. We host an annual tomato taste at the Silver Spring Farmers Market every year, uh, excepting COVID, of course. So mm -hmm. we hope to bring that back in late August, or early September again this year. But yeah, tomato passion, uh, you know, is something that a lot of people share in gardening. So that's great that you are able to uh, kind of you know, organize around that and spark that in a lot of people. Well, you know what? There's nothing like a homegrown tomato. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so completely different than a supermarket tomato. You can smell it. You, it's just like it's, I, I, it defies description. I just think it's the best thing. Agreed. And yeah, just even going around the farmer's market, if you don't have that sunny spot to grow great mm -hmm. tomatoes yourself, you know, go to somebody who's growing them locally and, and not just trucking them in in a refrigerated truck from somewhere else. I agree. So you're on Long Island and what is your garden like and what's, you know, the type of soil? I think I assume you're zone six or seven. Well, we're seven. It used to be seven A. I think we're seven B now. <laughs> creeping up. Yeah. So I have a lot of perennials. I don't have a big property at all. I'm like maybe, well, not for the area. Um, I'm maybe 60 by a hundred, which for where I am on Long Island is on the smaller side. Um, and I have a lot of perennials. I love black eyed Susans and echinacea. Um, got some knockout roses. I'm a pink, purple, orange girl. I just love that combination. It looks like candy. It just makes me happy. And in the back, of course, I have my tomatoes. Um, I grow a bunch of herbs, um, growing zucchini. Now I had such a hard time with zucchini last year because, um, it just wasn't pollinating. And I tried, I even hand pollinated and to no avail. It really, I didn't get one zucchini. I mean, I got one, but it was like, you know, stunted and ruined on the end yeah. because it wasn't pollinated. And so I said, I'm going to try again. I used to grow them with no problem. I don't know what the deal was. So I was at the nursery a couple of weeks ago and I saw, um, I forget what it's called, but it's a variety I'd never heard of that says it's self-pollinating. So I said, I'm going to give this a try. I brought two plants and I planted those. We'll see how that goes. Every year I like to try to grow one new thing. 
you know, just so that I can have the experience for myself. But also when people ask me, you know, what went wrong or whatever, I'll, I'll have some firsthand experience for them. Last year it was beets. Uh, one year it was corn. Um, oh, I did a garden huckleberry one year. So I always try to do something different. You know, this year I'm growing potatoes in grow pots, grow bags. You weren't the only one. DC area also experienced that same problem last year with zucchini and other squash not being pollinated. I don't know if it's the lack of pollinators, if it was just a weather thing that happened. But yeah, a lot of people ended up hand pollinating uh, their squashes last summer. So knock on wood, hopefully this yeah. summer will be a better experience. Yeah. And you know, Kathy, sometimes with gardening, you just have to shrug. It's like, I don't know. It just didn't work. You know, you just don't even know why. Even if you are, you know, well-educated on it, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Like we say, plants don't read books, right? <laughs> or plant tags, correct. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and yeah, I find that a lot. Like sometimes I will tell a reader who's really, or listener who's very disappointed about something that they bought and had high hopes for that, you know, you know, nine times out of 10, I think it's not your fault. I think that it either came, you know, with damaged roots or some other problem. And if you had three of the four plants that you bought survive, then that you're, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> it's probably true. Yeah. So let's talk about some frugal gardening tips. And I think we should preface that by saying um, we are now at, I think, record high level of gas prices across the nation. And we are looking at maybe a recession. That's what some economists are predicting. But even if we were having the most wonderful, rosy economic outlook, I think frugal gardening is a great way to go just because we want to put our resources into other things, right? We just don't want to spend it all on bags of soil and seeds. Of course. Yeah. And I agree. Like why spend money if you don't have to? I mean, there are some things that you don't have a choice about, right? But if you have a choice, it's always the, the better path. So for our first topic on frugal gardening, maybe we'll start with some of the basic supplies. Say you're a beginning gardener and I just got a community garden plot or a space that I cleared out in my front yard to grow vegetables. What would I start off with tool-wise and where would you source them to be able to get some uh, less expensive ones, but still good quality? If you're going to start from scratch, you know, starting seeds, um, you don't need to buy cell packs. I think yogurt containers, uh, even, you know what, Keurig K-cups. I feel so bad throwing those out every day, um, but they even have a... A drainage hole automatically popped in the bottom every time you brew a cup of coffee. So those are great for starting seeds. And, and you know what? It, they're still going to end up in the garbage eventually, but at least at least you're getting you're not buying something else and then putting two things in the trash. So I like to use those. Um, they have these soil blocking kits, which are great. Yes, you have to buy them, but they're very sturdy and then they're like lifetime. I can't even I can't see them breaking. And what they do is they they compress the potting mix soil into a very tight um, square block and you plant your seed right in that and you can water them and they hold up and your plants never get root bound because there's no pot, you know, they just grow to the edge of the soil and then they stop until you're ready to put them in the ground. So that's wonderful. You can use little Dixie cups, you know, anything that you save from last year. And if you did, I would just say disinfect them for using them just so there's nothing in there that, you know, you want to start with the best start you can. You don't want to, you know, be compromised because then, you know, you're putting all your blood, sweat and tears into these things. And then if they have a fungus or a disease, you have to start over. And there's not always enough time for that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was going to say that's especially important for members of the tomato, pepper and potato family that you want to start off with really clean pots. How do you recommend disinfecting, Jessica? I say 90%, um, like nine parts water to one part bleach. And then, you know, wipe it out, let it sit for a couple of minutes, rinse it well and dry it and you're good to go. I have in a pinch and I don't, I don't know if this is a great idea, but I have sprayed it with like a disinfectant spray just like quick because I was in a hurry. Um, just something, you know, to kill any pathogens that might be on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the same, like for your tools too, like your pruners or anything that you're going to cut between that you could just wipe them with a alcohol swab or with a disinfecting spray. So you were recommending pots and soil block. And what about for 
basic tools like a trowel or hand gloves? Well, for those kind of things, I would say, you know, I mean, the only way to save money on those really would be to, you know, check out garage sales, look online. There are a bunch, well, you know what, there's a bunch of sites where you can um, get things for free. There is a website called FreeCycle, um, and they even have an app. So it's FreeCycle.com, or FreeCycle is the app. And their whole thing is that you're not allowed to exchange any money. So people, it's different from, you know, eBay or even Facebook Marketplace, although Facebook Marketplace, those neighborhood groups are wonderful. And sometimes there are free things on there where people would put something out and they'll say curb alert and they'll just leave it at the curb and whoever comes and gets it, gets it. But they sell things also. Um, but free cycle is 100% free and people put all sorts of things on there from like, you know, old TVs, furniture, whatever, you know, but then also tools and garden tools, garage tools. They, they even put plants on there. Or if they started too many seeds and they have extra seedlings, they'll say, oh, I have, you know, 20 tomato seedlings, come and get them. You know, where are you? And it's great. You go on there and there's all different towns listed. You put in like your zip code and there's towns listed um, near you. And that changes from day to day, depending on what's being offered and where. Um, but you don't have to get something only from your town. There's no like residency restriction. You can just, you can go wherever you can drive 20 miles if you want, you know, if mm-hmm. it's free to you or more, but that's great. People do, you know, it, it's intended to keep things out of landfills, right? So anything pe- somebody wants to get rid of, they're going to put on there. So you can, you know, search for something specific that you're looking for, or you can just browse and see what's being offered. So for those kind of things, I would recommend something like that. But things like plant supports, there are so many things you can make, right? If you have a friend or a neighbor who's growing bamboo in the yard, I mean, they probably can't get rid of this stuff fast enough. They're likely always cutting it back, trying to keep it in check, you know, if it's the running type. So you can get some for free and and make TPs. And you might even find those on FreeCycle or another site like that, uh, Facebook Marketplace. Somebody might say, I have, you know, tons of bamboo. And then you can make like these teepees with them. You tie th- three or four together at their tops with a, a large uh, elastic, and then you just spread out the bottom and you sink the four posts, the four bamboo pieces into the ground. And, um, and you've got yourself a tomato support or a cucumber support or, you know, whatever you need it for. My, one of my favorite things, uh, um, saving money uh, supply wise, and, and I love this because I prefer it to the one you can buy. And that's a watering can. Hmm. I, you know, I have 30 years a journalist, always at a computer of one type or another, whether it's a laptop, a desktop, or going way back, a wang word processor, you know, and I got carpal tunnel in both of my wrists, tendinitis in both my hands, and that's mostly from the phone, um, but I'm a little messed up that way. So holding a, a, a full, large watering can can be difficult. It always takes two hands. I have to support, you know, the spout side because it's too heavy. It's not balanced. I find it kind of difficult. But it occurred to me one day that I never have difficulty pouring milk. I got a, um, a you know, the big plastic gallon milk jugs uh, mm-hmm. that, you can get, that you get at the store. I rinse it out well, and I put the cap back on and poke holes in the cap. Now, you can do it with a nail if you want. I put a scissor in. I'm like, I'm lazy. I put a scissor blade in, a small one, and I just twist it so that you get a roundish kind of hole. And you fill it up with water. You can leave it outside. It'll stand up to the elements. And I can, I water all my pots with that because it's, and it's balanced. I don't feel like one side is heavier than the other. And I can, it's very easy for me. Um, so I actually prefer the watering, the, the milk gallon watering can to the, the regular watering cans. Yeah. I use a uh, kitty litter containers, the pourable kitty litter. I don't, same principle. Yep. Same principle. Although they are a bit bigger than that milk gallon you're talking about so they are if you fill them full of water it's heavier than most of your watering watering cans but same principle but really good also for rainwater storage when your rain barrel is overflowing that's what i use i have like a whole row of them <laughs> they're, they're not they're not the most attractive looking you know they're <laughs> white but the label comes right off and that makes them you know a little bit nicer looking than some of the other kitty litter containers but great for water storage great for pouring but you know not for delicate plants like you said when you might 
poke nail holes in that cap to get a little mm-hmm. bit slower, more like rain like stream for them. I did want to dial back a little to where you're talking about free cycle and Facebook marketplace and just share that I've been having a great time on the Facebook buy nothing groups. Yes. Yeah. And those are neighborhood by neighborhood and like very small condensed neighborhoods. You know, they cap it at a few hundred people in a basically walkable area that way you're not expending extra gas and you know you're normally running errands in that same area so you're going to pass by that person's house anyway for coordinating pickups so that's always great too and they're they do have something called wednesday wish so every wednesday you can wish for something so if you're say looking for a wheelbarrow and nobody has put up a wheelbarrow offer in a while you could say i've been looking for a used wheelbarrow and you know, a lot of times I've had really good luck in asking for items and then all of a sudden they appear. So that's a wonderful resource to check out. That is wonderful. And you know what? It makes sense because I've got things that I'm not using that are just sitting there. I'm like, oh, one of these days I have to get rid of it. But if I saw somebody ask for it, I was like, yes, I happen to have one right here. <laughs> that's that's a great feature. I like that. Exactly. And we always have like that extra or, you know, we have like 10 tomato cages and we only use three. And somebody else asked for tomato cages. So we're like happy to to let people either have or borrow them. So that's always great. And then you mentioned yard sales earlier. And I've always been a fan of estate sales where somebody's closing out their house because they're retiring. Sometimes they're moving overseas. Or of course, sometimes it could be a death in the family or something like that. But normally all the tools, if you go into the garage or the shed or something, are ridiculously low priced and really good quality. I've gotten some great like Sears Craftsman 1960s and 70s tools for just a dollar or two that way. Wow, those are valuable too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're always amazed. But you know, if you think about it, cleaning out somebody else's house or your own house to be making a big life transition, you know, you're not taking all those tools with you. So that's a great place to, to pick up extra tools, extra supplies. Of course, Things like fertilizer and pesticides and cans, you know, that are old on the shelf, you probably want to avoid those. So maybe, Jessica, we could talk a little bit about that and some of the age of things. Like, so if a free cycle person or buy nothing or at a yard sale, you saw an old can of iron phosphate or something like that, what would you recommend people look for as far as whether it's still viable or useful, even maybe old seeds too? Yeah, well... Seeds are a gamble, right? I mean, some seeds can last a really long time if they're stored properly. But in that kind of a situation, you don't really know how they've been stored. You know, I store my seeds in the refrigerator, away from fruit, in a paper envelope inside a glass jar. But, you know, if someone's got them out in the garage in the heat and exposed to the, you know, the changing temperatures throughout the year, they might not. So I always recommend, of course, and I myself, I always test my seeds for viability before I try them out. Because again, you know, you have to wait, you know, some seeds germinate in a few days, some germinate in 10 days, some can take 20, depending on what you're growing. And if you wait, and it's a long time before you realize that most of them are not sprouting, you might not have enough time to start over, you know, to get your seedlings out in time, and then you have to go buy starter plants. So, you know, I test them and there's a couple of ways. Um, I put them in a, a paper towel that I keep moist inside a Ziploc bag and um, check it every few days. And then, you know, if I put 10 tomato seeds in there, for instance, and I'm always going to use tomatoes as my example, because I'm a, I'm a tomato girl, but it works with anything. If I put 10 in there, and then only seven germinate, that's 70% germination rate, right? So then I'll know I need to to sow 30% more in order to get the amount that I'm aiming for, you know, on average. So um, that's a good thing. But also there's like the sink test, you know, I like to say seeds, a lot of seeds are like <laughs> Salem witches. They used to say if they drown their witches and if they survive, I don't know, if they survived their witches, so they would kill them. And if they drowned, and if they drowned, well, they weren't, but they died. Mm-hmm. So it's the same kind of thing with the seeds. The floaters are are no good. So we have to get rid of those because they don't contain, they've probably dissipated like their life energy and what food stores or whatever's in there. But the ones that sink, if you, you know, put a bunch in a glass of water, those are generally fine. 
So that's another test. You know, something else is like peonies, peony supports and plant supports, right? Um, a lot of people go out and they buy these peony supports or they, because um, peonies are beautiful plants, right? For about two weeks in spring. And then they give up and they lay down on the lawn <laughs> until you cut them back. But I've seen gardeners use tomato cages to hold them up, but those cages are four feet tall, five feet tall. And peonies are maybe what, three feet tall? So you know, why are cage sticking out on the top of your beautiful plant with all these gorgeous flowers on it? And that, that's less than ideal, right? So they do make these supports specifically for peonies, but why buy them when you likely have something that will work just as well at home already, maybe in your attic or your basement? Lampshades, large lampshade frames are the perfect height and shape to support your peonies. Like if you have an old, and you know what? It's garden, it's a uh, gardening season coincides with uh, garage sale season and yard sale <laughs> season. So it's a perfect time to go out and look for an old lampshade. You could probably get it for a dollar, maybe less. Um, just take the fabric off and then place it upside down with the wider part. You know, they go out at an angle usually. The mm-hmm. wider part at the top, and just as the peonies, the eyes are sticking out of the ground, just as they're starting for the season, you just place that over the ground, and you could put little um those landscape little anchors. You could stick those into the ground if you want, but I just I just put a little soil over them, and they stay in place. And then the uh, the peonies grow up and out through them and hide them completely, and it holds them up beautifully. And you can leave them out all year. It doesn't matter if they get rusty because nobody will see them, you know, and <laughs> they last for very many years. So that's a trick that I like to do as well. I love that. That's such a perfect use, especially for old stained lampshades or maybe it came from a smoker's home and, mm-hmm. you know, yellow or stained. So just rip off that old fabric covering and then you have still have that great wire frame for it. That's I'm going to be on the lookout for them now myself. And, and check those out. And that can maybe even be used for other perennials too that are a bit floppy as well. So that's great. You could use the tall, narrow lampshades for that versus the, the wide ones for the peonies. And so the next supply I was going to ask about are fertilizers because we are about to see a huge spike in fertilizer prices due to the situation in Ukraine and also the fuel prices. So that all is tangled up together and farmers are already starting to really feel that pinch and that's going to affect our food prices down the road. But for the home gardener, we might not see that fertilizer spike in price quite yet, but you'll probably start seeing sticker shock. So what are some of your cost saving tips for fertilizing? I've got plenty. I love, I love all these little home remedies and, you know, some work and some don't. So it's important to know, you know, which is an old wives tale and what really works. And I've got some that I think, you know, really do work. Um, And, and Kathy, you mentioned that the prices um, haven't really reached the consumers yet, but you know what? Fertilizer is cheap to begin with. So (laughs) even, even in a better economy without the fuel and Ukraine crisis, I mean, it'd be great to save money on fertilizer. And there's so many ways you can get, you know, free fertilizer. The easiest way um, when you're talking about turf grass is to return grass clippings to the lawn. So if you have a push mower or a powered mulching mower, just remove the bag and let the grass clippings remain on the lawn. As they break down, they're going to release nitrogen into the soil, and then you'll never have to fertilize. That's Lawn fertilizer is 100% nitrogen because nitrogen supports green leafy growth, and that's all grass is. It's leaves. So um, that's nitrogen, and that you're going to get all you need when those grass blades decompose into the soil. Um, and if you don't have a mulching mower, that's fine. If you have a leaf blower, some of them shred on reverse. So you can vacuum them up and blow them back out into the lawn. That's another option. I, ju- I would just warn people not to put fresh grass clippings into garden beds because um, the nitrogen is is too strong and it will burn your plants. But it's okay for the lawn, but it will burn plants. So if you want to use grass clippings as a mulch, you can. You just need to dry them out first. So lay them out on a tarp in the driveway or somewhere and just give them a toss every day. It should take a few days. And once they're completely dry, then they're safe to use as mulch in garden beds. Hmm. So if you had a bagging mower, you could collect them all in the bag and then dump out the bag and let them dry. If you wanted to use them as mulch in garden beds, yes. But single, you know, in a single layer, thin layer on like a tarp or something so it's easier. Or it doesn't even have to be. I mean, you could rake them up, but just to keep things neat. And then, of course, Kathy, there's always compost, right? Yes. It's the single best additive available for improving any soil. 
It increases the water holding capacity of sand. It increases the drainage of compost. It, it has an incredible amount of nutrients. It, if you mix in a generous helping of con uh, compost into your beds or into your planting holes, you will likely not need to fertilize for the whole season. It depends on what you're growing, of course, but you don't even need to spend money on a fancy compost bin or tumbler. You can just pile up your compost ingredients in the back corner of the yard, or you can make a small, cheap compost holder with 10 feet of chicken wire. Just form it into a circle, attach the ends with wire and insert four wooden or metal stakes into the ground around it and you're done. But you know what? You can even just collect your kitchen scraps in a bowl. And at the end of the day, you can do lazy composting, which is just bury your daily kitchen scraps into the garden alongside your plants. You don't even have to compost them and they'll just naturally decompose. You just need to go down, I would say about 10 inches or a foot so that you're not inviting animals because uh, that would be a big downside. I was going to say at the bottom of a planting hole would be perfect to, to add some of those in. Sure. As long as it's deep enough. Yeah. Um, but just like compost, you just would never include any fats, no animal products. Um, but, you know, banana peels and stuff like that, um, you know, vegetable peelings, of course, you know. And I, I, I know a few people who actually bury a fish underneath all their vegetable plants. People swear by this. They bury a whole fish under each plant. And it, I mean, it makes sense. I use um, fish emulsion, emulsion, which isn't cheap. So it makes sense. So they bury this fish under each plant. And as it breaks down, it provides nitrogen. Phosphorus, potassium, those are all the NPK, the three main ingredients in fertilizer, right? Plus trace elements like calcium, magnesium, chlorine, sodium, magnesium, I mean, all these sulfur, all good things that plants need. So bury a fish, that might, that's, that's scientifically makes sense as well. And speaking of a animal byproducts, like the, your fish emulsion, what about sourcing manure from your local stables or a farmer? That's a wonderful idea if you're lucky enough to live near one, for sure. You just have to age it, of course, because if you put fresh manure, I think you could put fresh chicken droppings, right, onto plants, but rabbit too, I believe, but not, you know, horse, cow manure. That needs to age. I would still probably side on caution and still age my chicken and, and rabbit and other manure for maybe about three months. Same thing with goat and sheep. Mm -hmm. At least three to six months, you know, in a pile to the side before I mixed it in. Yeah, I really honestly don't have much experience with that. Again, I'm a city girl, remember? <laughs> <laughs> the cats told me I was into agriculture. I didn't know it. <laughs> yep. But that is one, if you have animals, obviously that's free to you and free for you to use. And then, of course, if you have a friend or know somebody who is giving away animal manure, if they can age it for you even better. And you know what else, Kathy? When you boil vegetables and throw out the water, you're pouring free fertilizer down the drain. It's full of vitamins, all the vitamins, you know, that leached out of the vegetables. Um, so you can let it cool and water your plants with that. And water from boiled eggs is full of calcium. So you can use that water to water your tomatoes and your peppers to help stave off um, blossom end rot and add calcium, which they need. And you can even use eggshells in place of garden lime. Limestone is made of calcium carbonate, right? And eggshells are also made of calcium carbonate. So that makes sense. You just dry out the eggshells for a day or so. You can even microwave them, I guess, for a minute just to like dry them, dehydrate them a little, and then pulse them in a food processor. Same with banana peels, let them dry for a day or so. And then it's full of potassium. You know, banana peels are great. And you just sprinkle it on your plants. Same with coffee grounds for acid loving plants because it does lower the pH a bit. I don't know if a lot of people know, but if you wanted to use coffee grounds either in your compost or just to sprinkle around your acid loving plants like blueberries, rhododendrons, azaleas, those kind of plants, um, you can go to Starbucks in the morning and just ask them to save you their coffee grounds. And then you pick them up at the end of the day. They have a program where they'll give it out for free. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of local coffee shops do that as well. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say about the the eggshells, I do that. I just zap them in the microwave for a second. But I'm throwing out whole banana peels into the garden, and they don't decompose at all. <laughs> so I'm going to take your tip of pulsing them 
and grind them up a little bit because the whole peels just take forever. I still find them, you know, months later in there. Same thing in the compost pile when I throw a whole banana peel in. Of course, I take that little plastic sticker off court, you know, beforehand. You know, if you had like a dime for every one of those little plastic stickers. But yeah, I still find the the banana peels whole because they're so thick and fibrous yeah. that, yeah, it probably pays to chop them up or grind them up before you put them out. And and the opposite, like if you have, so the, uh, the coffee grounds will lower a bit I'm not going to create miracles but it will lower your ph a bit and they do have nitrogen magnesium potassium so they do add nutrients to your soil if you have acid loving plants but if you have plants that need a more alkaline soil you can add some fireplace ashes hmm. um, because they will raise the ph and make the soil more alkaline and also there's some there's some nutrient benefit there as hmm. well and you can maybe use them in place of lime mm-hmm. and you know what if you have a fish tank fish tank water is full of nitrogen and other nutrients so instead of you know when you're cleaning your fish tank instead of dumping the water you can down the bowl or wherever you dump it down the sink you pour it onto your plants so true because i know that all the plants that are around my little water garden are in much better shape than those that are just a little bit farther because they get watered by dipping a can into the pond and getting that really good fish poopy water <laughs> is what I call it. It's like the, the, the trademark fish poopy water. I like that. <laughs> so for our, our next frugal topic, and I think this is the one that most gardeners w- want to know is saving on plants because that's the biggest part of our our gardening budget, right? Our new perennials, new shrubs, new trees. So what are some great ways to save on new plants? Well, fall is the best time to save on perennials. Nurseries are trying to liquidate their remaining plants, right? So you can really score some steep discounts in the fall, but you have to make sure that the plants are healthy because they've probably been sitting on a shelf all summer, right? Which means they could be root bound or suffering from root rot or have a mold or fungal disease. So inspect them carefully and then make sure that plants aren't root bound. You know, turn pots over, check that the roots aren't growing out of the drainage holes, but If they are, that means the plant has overgrown the pot and that stresses it out. So, but it still might be a good buy as long as the roots are healthy. So what I do, and people feel uncomfortable doing this, but you're allowed to do it, slip the plant out of its pot. Gently, you're not ruining it. (laughs) Just take it out of its pot. And first of all, the all come out in one piece, you know, the soil that the root should be anchoring into the soil. And if it's not, that's your sign right there. Those roots are not doing their job. So you don't want that plant. But if it comes out, and it probably will, just inspect the roots. If they're, you know, a dark yellow or brown or, God forbid, black, or if they're mushy, you know, that's no good. They're, they're done. So um, you don't want those. And if you see a tangled mess of roots encircling themselves, that means they're girdled and they're just growing around themselves because they've been in the pot for too long and they have nowhere else to go. So they're kind of choking each other them themselves off. So try a different plant. But if they're all pot bound, you can still get them. As long as there's no sign of rot, if they're, you know, fresh and cream colored and healthy looking, you just need to tease them apart before you plant them. And you can use a fork to scrape the sides of the root ball or just clip them with pruners here and there, which I do, or or just gently rip them apart with your fingers. Um, You won't kill it. Just be gentle. And then they kind of wake up and then start growing outward. And that's all you need. So you can find sales during the fall. And then if you, you know, during spring or in summer, if you you want to buy plants, obviously during planting time so that you can enjoy them for the upcoming season. You know, many people, I've heard a lot of advice to gardeners that recommend buying smaller plants to save money and then having patience, right? Waiting for them to grow. But in a lot of cases, I say get the biggest one. Hmm. If you compare the cost of purchasing a larger plant that can be divided into three or four plants with that of buying several smaller ones, you might come out ahead. So you have to do the math, but I, oftentimes you'll come out ahead. And many perennials that we know can be divided, right? And that's not just when they're overgrown. Many larger plants can be divided as soon as you get them home from the nursery. So spending more on a gallon pot that you can divide into two or three plants to me makes a lot of sense. And any perennial with a fibrous root system can handle this. Plants like hosta, black-eyed Susan, echinacea, purple coneflower, right? Salvia, so many more. And ornamental grasses. Any herbaceous perennial with a root ball or bulblets like daylilies, they can be divided this way. 
just slice through the root ball with a gardening knife. I like the Japanese hori hori. Mm-hmm. You know, that's another way to save money. Get a tool that does performs many things. I, I try not to get tools that only do one thing. So like a Japanese hori hori knife, it cuts through soil. If you need to cut roots in the soil, you can. You can use it to plant bulbs. It's good for many uses. You know, you get it from one purchase. So to me, that's a frugal strategy. And then, you know, remove the plant from its container, separate its leaves Mm -hmm. to see where they attach to the root, and then cut through that portion. And as long as there's two or three healthy leaves on top of each root portion, your new plant should grow and thrive. You just plant it elsewhere, you know, plant one here, one there. And, And I think you've saved money. To me, that's... That makes sense. I love that. My little trick is, you know, when you look at a four pack or something of annuals Mm -hmm. uh, in the springtime, and sometimes there's an extra one in there, like there's five in a four pack. So, so you'll find me combing through the four packs, looking for the one or two that have an extra little plant that you can pull apart in there. Yes, they dropped the ball when they were thinning them out. (laughs) I love those. (laughs) It's like an extra bonus. And then, of course, once you have a perennial in your garden, um, in most cases, you're sitting on a little plant factory. Plants like hosta, ornamental grasses, once you buy them, you never have to buy them again. After their third year, you know, the old, you know, the first uh, first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year year they leap. Um, After that third year, most perennials are large enough to be divided. And since you only need three healthy leaves attached to each root portion, I mean, you can make a lot of babies. So that's, it's another um, strategy that I always use. And regardless of root type, you know, like the, um, there are some plants that like are running or spreading roots, right? They, they send roots down into the ground, but then they have other roots, uh, secondary roots that grow horizontally on the soil surface or sometimes just below. So that's even, you know, easier to divide. You just clip the, the horizontal root that's root that's connecting one plant to another and then you just dig one up. And you could do that with ground covers like ajuga, bugleweed, bugleweed. I never know how to pronounce that. Mm-hmm. How do you pronounce it? Yeah, bugleweed. bugleweed. Or, but I think most people say ajuga around here. But yeah, same thing with like creeping jenny or anything that spreads by underground stolons. Right. Yeah, super easy to separate that way. All you need is a tiny section of root really for most of them. Yeah, so that's that's something that I don't think occurs to some people. Um, it didn't occur to me for the first portion of my gardening life. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> why am I buying more? Um, and of course you can take cuttings. They just take a five or a six inch portion of a stem is from the strongest, healthiest stems on your plant. Cut it on the diagonal, dip it in rooting hormone if you have any, and plant it in a 50-50 mix of perlite and peat moss. Again, use that old yogurt container, leftover pot from the nursery. Just make sure there's drainage holes in the bottom, old cell pack, and keep the soil moist. And they root pretty quickly, you know, and then when you give it a gentle tug, if you feel resistance, you know, you've got a root and you can plant it. And then for succulents like sedum autumn joy, you don't even have to go through all that trouble. I just I just clip the top of new growth in the spring and I bury it right in the ground where I want it. And usually in a, a shaded spot, but right next to the other one. So now I have like a, a growing every year I do it and I have a growing line of them. I think succulents are the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> There's, you know, almost always you can just break off one part and regenerate a new plant with succulents. Yes. Yeah. And that's, and if, if you just take a few minutes to do that, it's not like it's a big time, time suck. You just do it. You're saving so much money and you know, you're saving your trip to the store too. So, <laughs> and also, you know, you're saving your plant because sometimes it breaks off en route <laughs> to your home and you're like, Oh no, I snapped off the top of that sedum or, you know, if it's a tall it. one. Yep. Yep, we've all done it where, you know, something is snapped off a plant part and you're like, will this root in water or will this root in soil? So you you can experiment with both of those ways. And, you know, of course, growing from seed is the most obvious tip, but that's also more cost efficient than buying starter plants. I mean, a package of seeds costs anywhere from like dollar and change up to maybe maybe four dollars maybe a little bit more i've never seen a packet of seeds for more than five dollars uh, more than four dollars and even at that high end consider again i'm going to go back to tomatoes <laughs> consider you get what 100 200 tomato seeds in a pack for under five dollars 
that's about the price of one starter plant. Of course, you'll need the seed starting supplies, but if you use the recycled you know, containers and, and a shop light, you don't need to buy a fancy plant seed starting light. You can use an ordinary shop light with a fluorescent bulb that you have in the garage and it works. The only other thing you need is a bag of sterile seed starting mix. And consider the price of produce. A pound of tomatoes can cost the same or more than an entire seed pack. You know, So the savings is really tangible. Well, in our last few minutes together, I wanted to ask how listeners can get in contact with you or follow you on social media, and then maybe for some final frugal gardening thoughts. But let's get that contact information first. Okay, well, my website is jessicadamiano.com. It's D-A-M as in Mary, I-A-N-N as in Nancy. Oh, I always spell it out. <laughs> Some people have trouble with it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like Damien with an O. So jessicadamiano.com. Um, and I do have a weekly newsletter called The Weekly Dirt. It's free. I would love for everyone listening to subscribe. Every week I answer a reader's question. I have a Q&A section. So I'd invite people to send in their questions. I publish a reader photo of the week because, you know, it's always so much fun. Be a little boy. Heuristic, be nosy. I mean, who are we kidding to look into other people's backyards and see what they're growing? But not only to be nosy, although that is valid, but also to, you know, to get inspiration for our own gardens. And then I, I write about a seasonal topic as well. So, you know, I invite everybody to, to join me there. On Instagram, I'm just Damiano, just with one S, J E S, Damiano. And I'd love to see you there as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for sharing all these tips. And I can't wait to try out that lamp one for my peonies. People are going to think I'm, yeah, (laughs) my neighbor's going to be like, really? (laughs) You know what? As soon as the plant grows, you won't see it anymore. It it grows right out of it and the foliage covers it. It's stealth. It's a stealth support. (laughs) That's what's so great about it. Definitely. So any final thoughts on frugal gardening or any final tips that we might have missed? I love the gift economy, those Facebook groups um, and free cycle that, you know, give away stuff that you don't need and get stuff for free. And I've even seen, you know, I've seen posted on free cycle and other groups like yours for the digging. And someone just has a bunch of Dutch irises or too many hostas or whatever, and yours for the digging. So you just show up at someone's house with a shovel and take what you need. It's incredible the things that people get give away. All you just have to know where to find them, you know. So poke around. I would say poke around, ask around. Some towns give away free compost. So if you go to your town's website, you know, see if they do. Mm-hmm. And the only problem is that you have to have a way to get it to your house. Wood chips. This is something else that I I wanted to mention. Um, If you have a tree that needs to be removed and you call a service, like they're going to show up with a wood chipper, right? But they have to dispose of those chips. And oftentimes they have to pay a fee to dump it. So they're very happy to give them to you for free as long as you have an appropriate area for them to dump it. So that's wonderful. And, and then there's also um, Chip Drop, which is another you know, site that will um, kind of like a matchmaker between tree removal services and, and homeowners looking for wood chips. And you, you, you register with them. And then when a tree is removed in your area, tree removal people just drop it off. They just dump it wherever you list that you wanted it. You can't pick the exact day, but that's a wonderful um, way to get free mulch too. Excellent. Yeah, I've tried that chip drop service myself. And it's true, you can't designate the day or time, but usually it's pretty often. And, you mm-hmm. know, free is free and delivered to you is even better. If you don't eat it all, you can get together with your neighbors and then everyone on the block gets, you know, free wood chips. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much, Jessica. We'll have to have you back on the Garden DC podcast sometime soon, maybe to talk more about tomatoes and some of your other specialties. I would love that. And thank you so much for having me, Kathy. This was a lot of fun. Chamomile plant profile. Chamomile, Metricaria chamomila, is also known as German chamomile or wild chamomile. It's also pronounced chamomile. It is an annual flowering plant in the daisy family that is used as an herbal tea. It is known for its curative properties, including treating anxiety and an upset stomach. It's also a terrific pollinator plant and repels some insect pests 
making it a good companion to other edible crops. It is native to Europe and is hardy from USDA zones 2 to 9. A close relative is Roman chamomile, Chamomila nobile. It is a creeping ground cover that is perennial and used herbally in the same way as German chamomile. Chamomile prefers rich soil in a sunny location. It can survive in hot climates with some protection from the afternoon sun, but it does better in the cool spring and fall seasons in our region. It does not need any fertilizer and it grows as well in containers as in the ground. Chamomile is easy to start from seed or you can purchase a small plant. In future years, you may find it reseeding itself where it grew before and you may never need to buy it again. To harvest chamomile, cut off the flower spikes and hang them upside down to dry for a few weeks to concentrate the flavors. After they are dry, snip off the flower heads and place them in a jar. Add a spoonful or so to a teacup and pour boiling water over them. Let them steep about five minutes, sip, and enjoy. Chamomile, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, we've entered hydrangea season. From my oak leaf hydrangea to the big mop heads to the smooth hydrangea, they are all looking fabulous this week and loving our weather. Over at the community garden plot, we finally got the tomatoes in the ground and we pulled one of our garlic bulbs just to check on it for size. Still too small, so I'll dry that one and still use it, but we'll wait a couple more weeks. The tops were starting to die back so we gave it a chance, but we'll give it a little bit longer in the ground. I wanted to give a shout out to listener David Kolch. Hey, David. And also let you know about some upcoming local events. So there are a series of tours by landscape architects in the D.C. area. And as part of What's Out There Weekend, Washington, D.C., June 18th and 19th, two days of free expert-led tours and you'll find out more information about that from the Cultural Landscape Foundation website and you can also check them out um, through the National Park Service and I'm going to give you the website for the Cultural Foundation tclf.org. A lot of them have already filled but there are still spaces left for several of them so check that out. And another type of garden tour, the Tacoma Horticultural Club based in Tacoma Park, Maryland and Tacoma, D.C. neighborhood of Washington, D.C. has open gardens every Friday evening of June and there are still a couple of those Fridays coming up and you can join that for free. That is welcome and open to anybody who wants to meet some garden club members and see a beautiful garden. TacomaHort.org. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jentz and Terry Spite, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space, while also making Making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City, comes out this spring. You can pre-order it now at Amazon.com and Bookshop.org.
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.